Welcome, and thank you for joining us for NCWIT's Conversation for Change, an online thought leadership series. Today's session focuses on elevating modern figures in computing. My name is Stephanie Weber, Director of K-12 and Regional Initiatives for NCWIT. I'm honored to be here with you today with Dr. Kyla McCullen and Dr. Jeremy mcgruger Waysom, co-hosts of the Modern Figure podcast, a series elevating the voices of Black female scholars in computing. Today, you will hear their stories and experiences while studying and working in the tech industry. But first, we wouldn't be here today without the support of our sponsor, the Department of Defense STEM. The largest employer of scientists and engineers in the nation. DOD STEM supports educational outreach to increase opportunities for inquiry-based learning and hands-on activities in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, particularly for underrepresented groups and military-connected communities. DOD STEM offers programs for students and educators ranging from pre-kindergarten through post-secondary, as well as professional learning opportunities for current workforce. You can find out more by going to their website, which we will share in the chat. I'd like to now hand it over to Dr. Jeffrey Ann Wilder, Senior Research Scientist and Director of Strategic Initiatives for Women and Girls of Color, who will be further introducing our panelists as well as facilitating our discussion today. Jeffrey Ann? Thank you so much, Stephanie. Hello, everyone, and happy Black History Month. Today, we are joined by the host of the Modern Figures podcast, Dr. Jeremy Waysom and Dr. Kyla McMullen. Dr. Jeremy A. M. Waysom is an assistant professor in the Department of Education at the University of Florida. Her research focuses on effective mentoring strategies for underrepresented populations in engineering. She earned her bachelor and master of science degrees and PhD in civil engineering from the University of Florida and now serves on the UF Ronald E. McNair Advisory Board. She is also a member of the Associate Provost Diversity and Inclusion Committee at UF. In 2018, she was awarded the Mike Shin Distinguished Member of the Year, female, by the National Society of Black Engineers. In 2017, she was inducted into the Edward A. Boucher Graduate Honor Society. In addition, Dr. Waysom was in inducted into the UF Hall of Fame in 2010 and is a recipient of the UF Outstanding Leadership Award. Dr. Kyla McMullen is a tenured faculty member at the University of Florida's Computer and Information Sciences and Engineering Department. Dr. McMullen has a personal commitment to encouraging women and minorities to pursue careers in computing and other STEM fields and is the leader of the SoundPad Laboratory at the University of Florida which focuses on the perception, application, and development of 3D audio. Her current, current projects include psychoacoustic analysis of the quality of customized head-related transfer functions, using 3D audio to sonify positional data for situational awareness, discovering critical interface design techniques for developing virtual auditory environments, and using 3D audio to immerse immersion and realness in virtual and augmented reality. Modern Figures podcast was inspired by Hidden Figures to showcase the expertise, education, and career paths of Black women and girls in tech. The podcast has an international reach and has been used as a resource for countless individuals across the U.S. for recruiting and supporting Black women in computing. The podcast has been supported by three NSF Broadening Participation in Computing Alliances, including the Institute for African-American Mentoring and Computer Sciences, IMCS, the National Center for Women in Information Technology, NCWIT, and the Computing Research Associations Committee on Widening Participation in Computing Research. Uh, so the Modern Figures podcast has been downloaded over 25,000 times across 58 episodes. Additional statistics for the podcast are displayed above. The average length of each episode is 60 minutes. The podcast has widespread reach being featured on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Stitcher, and also other platforms. Modern, Figure, Modern Figures podcast broad reach is also evidenced by the fact that it, it has been downloaded by listeners in over 76 countries. 
the top 10 countries are the US of A, Canada, the United Kingdom, Singapore, Korea, France, Germany, Israel, Angola, and Denmark. As a result of the success of the show, Copi's Waste McMullen created a nonprofit organization, Modern Fingers Inc., back in 2019. And the purpose of their, their nonprofit is to expand opportunities for engagement be, beyond the digital world. They successfully engage with audience, audiences from high school communities to multi campus college communities to conferences and computing across the country through a variety of speaking engagements. Many of these discussions incorporate the anecdotal evidence gathered from interviews recognizing that there is a critical need to expose students to role models in computing. So let us welcome Dr. Kyla B. Mullen and Dr. Jeremy Waysom. Hello, hi everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> all right, so let's just jump into it. And it's so great to be here with you, all, be with you both today having this conversation. So our goal today is and of course in this series, is to celebrate the con contributions of Black women and girls in computing and to empower more Black women and girls into the tech space. Let's just start by having you all tell us about your stories. Who or what has inspired you on your path? And tell us a little bit more about the work you do to broaden participation for Black women and girls in computing. And within that, we'd love to hear about the co courses that you currently teach or that you teach in general and what research questions you're currently pursuing. I know that was a lot, but <laughs> just tell us about who you are. It'll tie in together. I'll, I guess I'll start. Um, so I'm Kyla and my, I would say some of my earliest encouragement into getting into this area had to do with people who were in advisory roles. So first was like a teacher, another was sort of a college mentor slash scholarship program advisor. But um, I would say the one thing that everyone had in common is that they had knowledge that I did not have access to at the time. And I was receptive to said knowledge because I trusted them and uh, their pedigree and everything that they were telling me to do. So even in high school, you know, for some reason, I just thought you needed to be a white boy to study computer science. And I had a lot of apprehension, but I had a teacher who was a black male and brand new to the school. And I was like, oh my gosh, computer science can also, it was something as simple as having a black man in the classroom who was excellent in computer science to make me feel like I could actually do it myself. Then moving to college where I had a similar experience in terms of my scholarship program where there were tons of examples of black people who were getting PhDs and um, in sciences and in STEM and then in graduate school, the persistence also helped coming from peers as well. So I think that was the first part of the question. <laughs> where did it uh, come from? Remind me of the second part, Jeffrey. Yeah. There's a lot. There's really five questions. <laughs> one. So tell us your story. Who inspired you? And then present day. Tell us about your research and your teaching. Yes, so present day, my research, as Jeffrey had mentioned, is in virtual reality and augmented reality, especially realistic use of sound in these environments to help with situational awareness. So um, right now we have a project where we are helping firefighters to get oriented in situations where they are not able to see. So we're doing lots of uh, perceptual experiments. So you never go into computer science thinking, oh, I'm actually gonna do some psychology experiments, but you know, we designed the technology and we, since we're in human-centered computing in my division, we have to actually measure humans. So uh, that's one really cool thing we're working on. Also have another project I'm working on with a pediatrician where we're looking at using virtual reality uh, to help adolescents to disclose sensitive topics um, during their uh, examinations. Also have a fun project where we're uh, looking at using 3D audio for the museum experience. So anywhere that you can throw realistic sound into, that's what I'm doing. Um, in terms of classes, I have a class based on 3D audio. So that's always a fun class. Um, and also teach a class called uh, Computers and Modern Society. So we can take a step back 
and think about the actual implications of the technology that the students are being trained to create to look at how it impacts society, um, what it means for the future of society. I have I usually teach it in the fall, so we're definitely going to talk about chat GPT in the fall because it's a new, you know, it has so many ethical societal, so many implications for life. So and yeah. it's modern. And it's modern. <laughs> it is modern. It's a class that I have to update literally every time I teach it because things get old, new things come out, but it's a fun class. All right, so, Dr. Waysom. I'd say for me, um, I tell people all the time I'm a fake computer scientist, <laughs> <laughs> which is fine. I mean, you heard my bio, all of my degrees are in civil engineering, but you know, my interests in a lot of that came from when I was in like middle school, to be honest. And I was always that kid who loved math and science and performed well on those exams. I did well in all of my classes, but those were the things that I was drawn to. And um, my dad worked at AT&T. He actually worked there for 30 years and retired from there. And so I remember like, I would say my earliest influences in computing are from him having the guts of multiple computers on our dining room table, much to my mom's frustration, um, talking about different you know, pieces of hardware, how they go together, literally building back a better device and then you know, putting in the software, programming it. So like I had exposure to computing when I was a little, little kid, um, playing video games and all that stuff, right? And so, that's like a thing that was always around. Computing was something that was something I wasn't unfamiliar with. And even though I didn't choose it as a major in college, I did computing when I was in middle school classes, right? Like I learned JavaScript, which is like ridiculous. And then when I transitioned into college, I did C++ and I hated it. And I was like, okay, this is not for me, right? Like this isn't a thing for me. We also had like a like numerical methods course in oh, yeah. civil engineering, also a thing that I hated. And so as I got exposed to those things related to computing, I knew it wasn't that end of that space that I wanted to be in. Um, when I was in grad school, I actually got to the point where it was like, I have ridiculous amounts of data, like data, 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 data. And yeah. I showed Kyla, cause we'd met at this point and I was like, dear faculty member in computer <laughs> science, please help yeah. me. <laughs> like this data is like enormous. You had like 80 something thousand rows or 800 yeah. something thousand rows in an Excel sheet. So imagine an Excel sheet, like how clunky that could be, right? And then trying to like- The page wouldn't scroll. Like yeah. there was so much information. <laughs> trying to program that and um, so that like I could, leverage the power excel is a very powerful tool but coding is a lot simpler to analyze that that amount of data and my advisor wasn't a fan of my code that i ended up writing in matlab so we abandoned that and went back to the excel method but that was the first time i was like oh this could really change some things for me in my world in in civil engineering um and so when i ended up Kind of transitioning into computing was actually when I was like, I don't want to be <laughs> in a space that's not interested in innovating and moving forward, yeah. right? Like I'm somebody who's trying to better myself. I feel like the discipline should be doing that too. And um, I ended up taking a role as a project manager for the Institute for African American Mentoring and Computing Sciences. And then I was really a fake computer scientist. <laughs> um, so I would say like all of that journey um, people still think that I'm a computer science yeah, faculty think, member yeah. <laughs> and will come to me. And the great thing about that is I've had opportunities for grants and funding and support. Right, she so, has grants from computer science. So she's a computer scientist. Yeah, I, I have funding. I, say, I think it's official at this point. Right? It's, it's official, official, but it's she's not official. She's in denial. I feel like, yeah. So anyways, I'm in denial, but that's where it all comes from. I teach a course. So I actually ended up teaching like baby, baby circuits. I mean, baby circuits and I also like intro drag and drop block coding in a course that I teach. So I'm a fake computer Ladies scientist. Ladies and gentlemen, a computer scientist. Um, <laughs> and it's called engineering design and society. So the same yeah. kind of connection to society 
where we want our students at the University of Florida really to understand that design has implications beyond just what you create, right? Like it impacts humanity. So the human centered components of design. So I put two things together about your story that I've never put together in all the time I've known you. You were doing civil engineering, which is about like building a structural thing, but you're also building computers. So that <laughs> background, I'm just saying it's it's been there the yeah, whole time. I'm I just made that connection yeah. this this time. But yes, yeah. you've been building things. It's it's all together. Okay, so who's gonna buy Jeremy that I'm a computer scientist? <laughs> Because you need one, <laughs> right? I don't you need a freeze, yes. but you know, it's well, here. It's in my it's, spirit, it's, apparently. It's officially official, and I also have to say, it, for as knowing you both as long as I have, I did not know um, your origin story, how the both of you met. So I think that's really neat as well. The fact well, that you saw out, right? Yeah, we I love that. prior to the code thing, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, we. I was coming to Florida, the power of networking and community. I was coming to Florida, and I had a friend who said, "Hey, you're going to Florida. Meet my friend." And then it wasn't me. And it wasn't Jeremy. And then said friend was like, well, I'm going to bring my friend who's an engineering. And then we hit it off and said, oh, no, no, no. I invited myself. Oh, I thought she, okay. she was telling, <laughs> she was telling me how she was going to meet this faculty member in computer science and like, yeah. Her line sister told her about her, and I yeah. was like, okay, Mind you, neither of us are Greek, yeah. so the sorority put us together, even though neither of us are Greek. And then I was like, you know what, I'm just going to come, because yeah. I was like, she sounds cool, yeah. right? And the like, two of us are just going back and forth the whole time, like, oh yeah, you're here too. <laughs> <laughs> I love this chemistry, and we'll talk about the Greek stuff after the webinar, right? Like, I'll, I'll put a bug in your ear separately, but I love to hear, it's so great to hear the story around how you met because it really does speak to this chemistry the work that you would do down the line and really the importance of like mentorship and stuff which I know we're going to talk about a little bit later so the next question it is black history month right so we do need to you know right we have to rep black history month right not just in February but all year but it right. is black history month so in honor of that can you all share um celebrate or talk about one particular program or individual who you believe has served as a change agent and really making the tech ecosystem more inclusive for black women and girls. <laughs> um, there are a number of people who I think should and could be acknowledged, but I have to say my answer is gonna be Juan Gilbert. <laughs> um, I would not be where I am without his intervention, Kyla feels the same, same way. <laughs> um, it has literally, that relationship changed the trajectory of my life. I was gonna say career, but like really my life, I was in a place where I was like, no, 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 like I can't stay in academia. Yeah. Um, and so the opportunity to move into a tech related field was amazing. But then once, once I was there, it was, all Kyla says all roads lead back to Juan. <laughs> yes. Right. And so yeah. the work he's done to champion black people in tech, yeah. which includes black women and girls, um, has really been transformative. And I think his career is one that a lot of us like would aspire to. And yeah. um, I'll let Kyla no, you. I agree with everything you were saying because even uh, I met Juan when I was in my second year in grad school. And can I just stop you for one second? Um, I know I know who Juan Gilbert is, but can you tell everyone else, like, give us a little bit more about like exactly who Juan Gilbert is? He I is Juan Gilbert is, is a full professor, full Andrew so Andrew Juan. Banks, Andrew F. Banks, Banks family, family preeminence. Ooh, professor. professor and chair of the Department of Computer and Information Science and Engineering at the University of Florida. And prior to that, he <laughs> was the uh, uh, division chair of human centered computing at Clemson. Prior to that, he uh, achieved tenure at Auburn University in Alabama. Um, but just someone, so that is his pedigree, but he was also the PI for the Institute of African American and Mentoring Computing Sciences. Prior to that, I met him when he was uh, putting on conferences. He had a few NSF awards where he said, we need to gather Black people who are doing research in computer science because we need network. And part of his story is that he didn't have 
network. He didn't have people, you know, it took a lot. So once he got into a position where he was able to uh, convene folks, he decided to. And he is definitely an ally, an advocate, and everything. Um, the thing that I you just love the most is that if he meets you, he's immediately in his head fitting you into some area of how can I help this person? So something might come across his desk and he's like, okay, let me send Jeffrey in an email because we talked and she said that word to send this email. So he's super open with like opportunities, with anything. He just believes in people. He gave me my first, I don't say gave, I interviewed, but he was the person who even exposed me to the opportunity for my first job coming right out of graduate school and not wanting to be a professor. Here I am later winning the career award, got tenure, and I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have even thought of this as an opportunity, you know, without him. So I was going to be a housewife. <laughs> I <laughs> was, I was so over, yeah. I was done. I was done. The PhD <laughs> took it all out of me, all the energy, all the joy, all of, all of it. It was gone. It had taken it. After and like, your first three weeks of housewifery, you would have done <laughs> something else. That's what he said. That's what he said. And so it was almost like I, I didn't realize what was happening in these meetings that we would have that ultimately shifted my yeah. interest, gaze. What I, like sneak mentoring. I, yeah, sneak mentoring. Yeah. yeah. And he does that for a lot of people. So like yes. part of what his role was with IMCS was to help graduate students figure out where they wanted to go and then help them make those connections and build those relationships so that they could either get an academic position, a, a position in, in industry, the field of government. industry. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. he has all the connections. People come to him and say, hey, who do you know? And he goes, here are the people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Juan is really, um, you know, he's a huge, you know, champion advocate, but he's also, he's made a lot of Black history as it relates to um, faculty presence, underrepresented yeah. faculty presence in computer science departments. Can you tell us a little bit about, a little bit more about that type of history and the mark that he's made at the University of Florida? Yeah, he's very intentional about hiring diverse faculty and a lot of pushback he usually gets is, hey, you're just hiring people who look like you. And he's like, well, when other cultures do this, no one says anything. However, you know, when he does this by finding qualified black people who may be overlooked in the pool, all of a sudden, you know, there's a problem But he's, uh, I think at one point, did we have five or six black faculty in a computer science department? I think it was five in our department and that's unheard of. We're head and shoulders above every other school in that respect, even in terms of women. We have more, it's usually University of Florida and North Carolina State University that are uh, head and head for who has the most women and that grand number is six. <laughs> so it's not some huge number, but he's definitely, he's definitely intentional about helping and creating a diverse population pool because he's also in human-centered computing. And one of the principles for universal design is that you need to have everyone at the table to design solutions. So he's being very intentional about getting the researchers in the room and at the table to create these diverse solutions. Love it, love it. So, um, you know, huge celebration and huge thank you to Dr. Juan Gilbert at University of Florida. All right, so let's talk about your podcast, right? Yeah. So. Um, I earlier kind of talked about all the people who are listening to the podcast, how many episodes you have, how many downloads you have. Tell us about, um, you know, a little bit more about the podcast influence on the culture, right? So uh, what have you learned as a result of doing this podcast and, and how do you feel about creating a platform like this? One thing I would say that I've learned that I didn't realize was a huge strength is the power of community. And I know the power of community in my own story. I know it anecdotally from other people. But once we have folks come on to the podcast and talk about how, oh, I didn't feel welcome. So I made this group or I started this organization and just how much the power of community can change someone's trajectory. And then also on the converse, people leaving because they were isolated. So um, that was something I really wasn't uh, expecting to, uh, to find out. 
The influence on the culture, I would say we definitely bring light to saying, hey, Black women are also in this space too. I know we're a very niche sort of subcategory, but the people who are here are squarely here in this space. You have found the right place. So um, I think it just brings us more to the forefront to show that Black women are definitely in the tech space. We have issues and concerns that aren't being addressed and we're highlighting you know, those needs. I would say like for, from my perspective, podcasting is hard. That's the thing that I think people assume that it's, oh, they just record some stuff and put it on the internet. And it's no, it is nothing like that. Like even from the getting support to pay for it, navigating the challenges of like, you know, where, what context you exist in, um, equipment, mailing stuff, yeah. tech issues, calendar scheduling, like there's yeah. paying people, there, there's an inordinate list of chaos that's behind the scenes that no one actually right. gets to see. And then they just hear us talking to each other, which is very much just how Kyla and I talk to each other and inviting someone <laughs> in like what we're doing right now, right? Yeah. Um, and so that piece is fun and easy and we love that part it's the other side of it where it's just like the management side yeah. where we have highs and lows and you know we carry each other through those oh, yeah. things we like, have a good balance like, i'm not where i need to be kind of is, is fighting it and then i'm, I'm struggling over, jeremy's yeah. on it and we have a good balance and if both of us are struggling nobody Nothing happens <laughs> But more often than not, if one of us is going through it, the other person's like, I got it, friend. We're, mm-hmm. we're going. <laughs> I mean, it's very clear that you all are more than just podcast hosts, right? Y'all are, you know, your family. Yeah. Uh, favorite podcast guest so far? Jamaica Burns. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wanted to say it first. I wanted to say it first. So... All of our guests, if you listen to the podcast, every guest is super extra mega special to me. To us? <laughs> to us, yes. Uh, but I always say that at the, during the introduction. So that's why. Yeah, we, she says everybody is special. Everybody is our like, extremely oh. extra special guest every time they join. Um, yeah, Jamika is amazing. Like, Dr. Jamika. Okay, well, let me explain yes. why. So <laughs> I think the reason why is because I, when I see her, I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, she's incredible right like a rock star yeah it's like it's like meeting your favorite musical artist intimately and finding out that they're an amazing person like that they are as nice as they appear yes. and actually in person yes. and they're there for you like I feel like every time she speaks I need to write down all the words because she always has something just super I don't even want to say encouraging, just insightful, 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 and not just in the tech space. The tech space is her home, but I feel like she's one of those people who would make that kind of impact anywhere that she was. She has a very calming. I feel like I know her. Oh yeah. And I think that's the thing that, you know, we take for granted. Like we are asking people to tell really intimate details of their lives, like starting from their childhood. Yeah. And I felt really invited into her story in a way that like deeply touched me. Yeah. And I've had other instances with other guests where I'm like, oh, I didn't know this about you. Like, you know, we've had our friends come on the podcast where it's like, we know our friends, but then we learn something about them that it's like, well, I never knew this about you. Um, To have a, for me, a complete stranger really just open their heart and their experiences and like be that vulnerable on an episode was just like, okay, she's, this is a real deal human. And I want to be like her when I grow up. Yes. That's interesting because Jamika was, was she your first or if not one of your first? She was. was. Episode five or five. five. One of those two. She was in there. Yeah. 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 That's pretty amazing given how many more episodes you've you know, you've recorded over that time. All yeah. right, dream guest. Dream <laughs> guest. Yeah. We were talking about this. <laughs> yes. My dream guest has nothing to do with computing. It's just Michelle Obama. That's all. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <I> no. <know>. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, hmm. I'm not really sure. Like, I feel like it would honestly be 
like someone who's a musical artist who mm. uses technology in in you like, know what they do okay, like I can see that can you see know that. I feel like a Beyonce would be cool. Like think of all of the really innovative tech related content that she's produced. Yeah, that's true. And how she's but... thought about like really thoughtfully how to incorporate us as the audience in using technology. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty that. sure she's gonna do that at her concert, right? Yeah. No, that's gonna happen when she goes on tour. Yeah, of course, of course. definitely. Yes. But I would okay. to, to quickly talk about um, favorite, it's not a specific episode, but we did this series, we're in the series about just navigating the graduate school process. And I've been really enjoying that content. And we talk about everything from is graduate school correct for you to getting mentorship, advising, writing your proposal, like just demystifying all of those pieces of the PhD that you don't learn in a classroom that you're just expected to know by osmosis. Like I've been really uh, appreciating that series. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a, a really important point because, you know, some folks who haven't had a chance to listen to the podcast might think it's just focused on career pathways, right? But you all are doing so much more than, than that in your content and the conversations, right? You're mm -hmm. doing like really practical things like you just talked about that will be very, very helpful for maybe, you know, someone who's thinking like, oh, I don't know if I have what it takes to go to graduate school. But like you said, that whole demystification process I think goes a long way in your audience for your audience to know that like, I mean, you two are just, you know, living, breathing, you know, sort of examples of like what's possible. And the fact that you do it in such an accessible way, I think is really important for, you know, for anyone listening and, and hearing what you all have to say. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's shift gears a little bit. Well, not really. Let's continue on the conversation around mentorship. And Jeremy, I know that you actually did something really, really cool um, or in the midst of doing something really, really cool related to mentoring as it relates to National Academies, right? So if you all could talk about, you've already talked about how you all have kind of served as mentors for each other, the peer mentorship thing. You've talked about formal and informal mentoring, but let's talk a little bit, let's drill down a little bit more about how specifically that's important um, and how important it is to build a culture of mentorship for Black women, particularly for those women, those folks uh, who might be underrepresented in their programs and departments. And we'll start with you, Jeremy, because I know that you you want to kind of share out a really important thing that you're doing as it relates to mentoring. <laughs> okay, well, I was recently um, asked to join a roundtable on mentorship, well-being, and professional development um, as part of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine uh, roundtable. And it's- Huge deal. Uh, a really big deal. big deal. I am amazed and awe, thrilled, excited to be connected to some of like the foremost thinkers in in those three spaces. Um, and I, you know, we're still in the early stages, right? So we haven't really identified exactly what our task is going to be. But I love the fact that they're seeing this as something that's a relationship, right? Like it's not mentorship by itself or well being by itself or professional development by itself. It's where those things overlap, intersect, and what's important at those intersections. And so hopefully we'll be unpacking that through the next few years. And you'll see events and things related to that where you can join in those conversations and help us kind of move the national conversation forward around those things. But I think from our podcast standpoint, you know. There's a lot of anecdotal things that we can say because we haven't studied them yet. And it's something that, you know, our heart as researchers is really to look into this stuff and understand it and unpack it. But, you know, right now I would say there, there are all of those themes throughout the podcast episodes with the interviews of, you know, various people. And the strongest, most compelling thing that we've seen is every single guest has at least one person who told them they belong in computing. Mm -hmm. They said to them with words, you should be a computer scientist. Right. Have you thought about pursuing computing? And without that individual making that statement to them, someone that they respect and that they trust saying you belong, you should, yeah. without that one person, they say they would not be in the space. That's yeah, huge. It's monumental. Like you think of all the time that a person has in their entire life and then you saying words to them, changing their whole trajectory. 
And it's yeah. almost like one of those things where it's like, wow, if if we are more intentional about the relationships we build with students, yeah. right? Like, and this is when they're mostly when they're younger. There are a couple people who that happened to them in college. Yeah. So they made the transition in college. But like large in part, this is during your youth, when you're middle school, high school, those formative aged, years. Um, just having somebody that you trust say, this is an option for you. You're really good at this, this, and this. You should consider a career in that. Um, it will change someone's life, yeah. right? And the opportunities that they have. So having a mentor when you are younger, you may not call them your mentor, right? Like right. they may be that lady at church. That, right. That lady always has something to say. Talking to me or, <laughs> or it could yeah. be, you know, I go to this after school program and mm -hmm. there's this one teacher who just always is telling me opportunities and things like that. It could be a counselor. It could be anybody. anybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I would say too, like a lot of times mentorship involves the transfer of information that you wouldn't normally have access to. And I would say one thing I definitely noticed in graduate school is that other cultures and also undergrad, other cultures have access because, you know, let's say if someone comes and they're like an international student, they have these kind of almost built in communities and networks where they are, you know, passing ex not exams, but like homework to each other. Just there's this collective strategies. knowledge yeah. and strategies and like so much that um, underrepresented people who originate in America don't necessarily have that uh, that trickle down and that sort of history or that legacy of information and knowledge and people who have been there that say, hey, let me tell you, let me show you the game. So that's why mentorship is so important because Black women and girls may not have that network where they end up. And so there may be isolation there, but at least with mentorship, you can have those strategies and have um, just a way to cope and not feel like you're the only person who doesn't get it, but you don't realize the other people who do get it, they get it because they have information from other people. Yeah. And so like the community piece is, yeah. is a big one. I was talking to a student recently and said, you know, in the black community, we are a communal people, right? Like yeah. everything is centered around family and literally your community, right? Like yeah. the church community, the YMCA in your mm -hmm. community, like these relationships that you build where yeah. you are. And so in the absence of that, when you take someone and put them in a space where they don't have those relationships. And everyone have, else does. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. Like, you know, the whole, it takes a village thing and you are you don't have a village, right. right? Like you don't have elders, you don't have siblings, you don't have cousins and them over there. Like yeah. you don't have any of that and your family doesn't have the context and can't help you and support you. Yeah. Um, it becomes against our nature. Yeah to stay in a space like that. So I think that's important to acknowledge. Absolutely. And uh, I love how we have lots of diversity and inclusion efforts in you know, industry and academia, but you're recruiting someone into a place where they may not have support. So I think a lot of the efforts should first start in-house to try to create this community of support. And it doesn't have to be all people who look alike, just making sure that someone coming in who may not have that natural found community has a place that they can go so that they can have those same benefits. Because yes, we can say, oh, we recruited this many people and that many. Okay, what about the community that's there for them? What about the retention? What about uh, all these other pieces? So I think it kind of starts in-house first and then out of the house. Love that. Okay, uh, just a couple more questions before we jump into um, our Q&A. Um, so we've been talking a lot about uh, post-secondary um, landscape and you know, doctoral um, graduate areas. What kinds of things can we do to strengthen um, the meaningful and influential pathway or participation of young girls of color, like maybe in the K-12 space, particularly in the early K-12, like the PK through five space? What kinds of things um, should we be doing to bolster um, the exposure and encouragement of younger girls? I'm just thinking back to like, as someone who was always interested in computers, like what I would have wanted to see. And I think that having access to people, to programs, to initiatives that are around computing in an accessible way. Because I was a nerd. If you told me there's a computer over there, like, you know how people say, oh yeah, you lure kids with candy into a van. No, if you have a computer <laughs> in the van. 
<laughs> but uh, all jokes aside, like making it accessible, like I just really wanted exposure. I wanted someone to tell me what it was, like just having low hanging fruit, even in media and society, just having computing and lots of people being part of the conversation. My husband watches NCIS all the time. And like one of the scientists, the scientist is always a woman and now they have a woman of color on there. And I'm like, that's going to do so much for black women, just being able to see someone who is in a position. Yes, it's a fictitious show, but you can, you see this person doing all these experiments and all that. We need that for computer science. Um, the example was, I forget what it was, but um, what show came out, but I think for, Forensic science had a huge burst when, um, I forget what show it was came out, but it had maybe forensic files, who knows, but people wanted to major in forensic science and it just skyrocketed because of the influence of TV. What if we had a black computer scientist on TV doing something cool, solving, what if Jack Bauer from 24 was a black woman? <laughs> I'm serious. Wow. You know, just someone who's like, or the people oh, at CTU goodness. who were doing all that. Cause I'm like, if we can make, computer science look cool at an early age. We won't have so many fights to battle. We won't have so many things that we have to overcome and, you know, have to, I don't have to have in my head, oh, I need to get a Dragon Ball Z shirt and oil up my hair to be a computer scientist. You know, I would feel like, oh no, I belong exactly the way that I am. Dragon so. Ball Z is fire. So I don't even know why you threw that shit. But I don't want to have to. <laughs> like, I don't know what that is. But secondly, no, I agree that like having role models yes. is really yeah. what little kids need like they yeah. want to see who they can become yeah and unless we're present in those spaces it's really hard to know like this is something for me that's what did it for me yeah right like i've been exposed to all the things i, I knew i knew countless job opportunity directions that i could go in yeah but it wasn't until i saw a black woman in engineering with a phd mm -hmm. that i was like I'm gonna be her one day. <laughs> that's who I'm gonna be. Literally, that that's all yeah. it took. And I came home and I was like, mommy, I'm getting a PhD in engineering. And she was like, okay, let's figure it out. Yep. Right. And so that's all it really takes. Yeah. And so the stuff that we're doing, you know, we have some of our, I guess most of our episodes on YouTube because yeah. we think it's important for people to have access to see us, right. not just hear us. Um we go and visit schools we are doing our best to have a physical presence in spaces right. because we know that that's really inspirational for people yeah but also cartoons yes we need all that too mm -hmm. but i would say even another point of exposure uh dr chandra daly who was one of our recent uh guests her two daughters she had them when she was in graduate school so every black woman that they know has a phd or was getting a phd so when they were little they would call immediately call every black woman dr such and such as their name because she just assumed oh all black women have phds so that i, I was like this is amazing <laughs> and it's just the power of what you, she never said, hey, kids, all Black women have PhDs, but it's what you see <laughs> around you and what you grow up in that becomes part of just your culture and what you believe. And if we could just surround children with the fact that everybody belongs here and it's not something that's novel to them, I think that would make huge strides. That is so powerful. All right. So final question before we toss it to the Q&A, and this is kind of a fun one, right? So we're going to go back in time and hopefully we won't depress anyone in, in the process. So let's go back 20 years to 2003, okay. right? Y'all are, I don't know, three, four, five years old, right? Right, right, right. 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 Same, same. same. <laughs> so let's, let's go back two decades, 20 years. What advice would you give your younger self? Good job. <laughs> so I guess I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the advice I would give myself, because I'll just, I'll start off with who self was back then. Mm -hmm. I was somebody who's always been super creative, super outgoing, but also I felt I needed permission to do things, um, things that other people, I guess I didn't see myself doing. So I would just say to be fearless, to learn everything, to meet everybody. Like there's so many things that I'm doing now that have come from relationships that I've developed in high school, college, grad school years, like um, meet everybody, learn everything you can, talk to people who are different from you. Like you can learn so much from other people's cultures, like 
just not, but mostly the not being afraid to do everything. So for me, dance was my love. I would get on stage, I would dance, I would act, but you couldn't get me to sign up for this computer science class. <laughs> so it, it took a lot of convincing for this computer science class that was literally something where I just put my name down on a paper <laughs> at school. And I just had so much turmoil around that, but I could do all these other outgoing-ish things. So just being fearless. Love it. I was in high school, so full transparency, I, I was. And I think, you know, I was a very serious student where it was like grades were everything and I needed to do well on all of the things. And it was like a lot, um, a high lot. achieving human. And so I think I would tell myself to relax, mm. you know, like just give yourself grace it's okay right to not get the highest grade and everything will work itself out I, I feel like culturally and this was not my parents okay like for a while I blamed them and then I realized I was I was the problem right like I had really high expectations of myself mm -hmm. and I would just tell myself to just chill let's say that that's great advice for today, right? I, I, I received that from my 46 year old self. I'll take it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I'll take I that. Right, <laughs> right. It's only it's advice right. permeates the years. Grace and be fearless. I love it. That's my theme now for 2023. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna jump into the, the uh, Q&A. If folks um, have questions, please feel free to submit your questions through um, the Q&A module. And we'll try to get through as many as possible. The first question, how can computer software design improve the diversity of future technologists? Mm. There's a lot in that question. So mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some assumptions about this. So one way to read this question is how can the way that we design software improve the diversity or how does the software itself so i'll start with the first question the way we design software can be improved by literally just including more people at the table who don't necessarily have a tech background um, one example if let's say you're creating a learning science technology that is going to implicate lots of kids bring kids to the table because involve them in the process mm -hmm. kids who look like the whole united colors of benetton ad bring all the kids <laughs> to the table is that brand still out no, i don't know no. it's not still I, out. i don't know what i'm talking about anyway I don't. bring okay. anyway <laughs> bring everybody to the table because one uh one thing that'll happen as a response is that kids will say oh this is an option i didn't realize this like even just the exposure and i forget who was telling me this story that um there the same thing happened, but with black men in cardiac um, surgery. So they, there was this uh, intervention where they wanted to create a cardiac intervention for black people in a community. However, they were like, um, these people are a bit older. Let's train the young people in their lives to know how to run this study and get the data back. They did a longitudinal study and it was something ridiculous, like 90 something percent of the men who participated in that study were now in healthcare doing something related to cardiac. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'll find out um, after I remember who that was, um, who told me this the other day. And I'm like, it really is a simple, it's just involving people in the process. There was no coding done. There weren't, you know, do an open heart surgery, but involving them in the thought process for the design and everything. I think that's how we can get more diverse talent because that, you know, that involvement stuck with them for a long time. And when it came time to choose what you'd like to go in, to this was something they had experience and exposure with mm -hmm. so the next question is connected to the notion of diverse talent how can recruiters better source diverse talent and do you have any suggestions for pipelines or methods if you're interested in black people in computing then i would definitely start with the institute for african-american mentoring and computing sciences IMCS is a great resource for identifying Black talent in computing. Um, there is a listserv that we have that's for African Americans who have PhDs in computing. And or doing research, you might be a grad yeah, student. There are students in there, there are people in industry. And so, 
you know, sharing it out through that listserv is a great way to do that. And Dr. Kenneth Gaucher, who's at Morehouse College, would be the person that you would reach out to if that's something that you were interested in. And even more, uh, the Richard Tapia Celebration of Diversity in Computing is an excellent conference that's usually in the fall, early fall. And there is basically, I think, a two-day career fair, at least, where you can get a booth, the students submit resumes, you can have great interaction with uh, mostly grad students, but there also are undergrads that come to the conference as well. But it's just an excellent way to get not only diverse talent, but talent that is interested in their success. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great place. NSB is also a, the National Society of Black Engineers Conference. Both of us have participated in SB, still do participate in SB, and they have a huge career fair where you're like, NSB has like what, something? Around 10,000 people yeah. attend that conference annually. It's so, yeah. so you'll get all sectors of tech, but you know. That's in March. Yes. <laughs> Coming up. Okay, this next question. <clears throat> the message consistently to young women and girls is coding. This is a miss to me. What are your thoughts on talking about mapping passion to tech versus you must code? Mm. I mean, for me, it's, that's it. That's what you would do, right? Like, <laughs> what do you love? And then how does that relate to technology? Yes. Like, how would you link those two things? And yes. human-centered computing is probably where you would exist, if that's that sounds like you. Um, human computer interaction somewhere yeah. in that space UX human design, factors human UX. Factors. yeah um and so that can that doesn't necessarily mean so right every sector of industry needs tech yeah so what is it that you're passionate about and then how could that relate to technology yeah i would like to i agree 100 percent, and i would even take the word coding out and Talk about the design aspect yeah. as well, because there's so much that happens in the design phase. But I also want us to be careful not to farm women and minorities straight to uh, human computer interaction, human centered yes. computing. But I do think it helps you to get in the door as you're young. And then you can now take a wealth of computer science classes and you may decide, you know what, actually, I like algorithms or I like machine learning. But to get you in the door, we might have to give you something that's a little more applicable to where you are in life and how you can make things um, just more uh, relevant to you. I think uh, Dr. Gloria Washington at Howard University, she has a student who was studying how to mathematically look at African-American hair and do analyses and recommend products. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge example of even if you're interested in hair, there's a way to put hair and technology together. Like there's technology and everything, like Jeremy said. Yeah. All right, uh, final question. And this is directed at <laughs> Kyla. Um, what does your shirt say and where did you get it? It says, I am Black History in the Making, and it was at Target last <laughs> Black History Month. Target is what you call Target when you're fancy, but yeah. <laughs> there are also some really great modern figures, merchandise, yes, like t-shirts, right? So yes. let's take an opportunity to, to share with the audience where you can get some modern figures merch, right? Our merch is on our website. You can go to modernfigurespodcast.com or modernfiguresinc.com, either one, yeah. and it'll take you directly to our site. And there is a storefront that you yes. can look at. And if you want something that's not there, message one of us and we will make it happen. Yeah, um, you can see it like Kyla oh, yeah. has- I had earrings. Earrings made. that were made for us of our logo, so. Love, love. And Kyla's gonna be buying you that um, I'm a computer science <laughs> t-shirt. Right. Yes. I'm making that. No, that actually that sounds cool. like I want to be in the store. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey, and for yes. the reminder. It yes. is the oh, right this down. Hold on. Sounds like you need to make that part of your new merch, right? Yes. Yeah. I love it. And we're yeah. gonna call it the Jeffrey Ann. We name shirts after people. <laughs> there we go. I I love that. I love it. Um, Kyla, Jeremy, thank you all. Thank you both so much. Thank you to our audience. Um, this has been such a great, great conversation. I have thoroughly enjoyed talking with you all. I think I'm overdue for another um, episode on the podcast. So hit your yeah, yeah. up, right? I think it's yeah. time for me to get back on there. Um, at this point, I'm going to toss it back to Stephanie Weber, who's got some closing remarks that she's going to make um, as we close out our webinar.
Stephanie, I think you are muted if you want to. There you go. I am muted. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank Dr. Weiler, Dr. McCullen, and Dr. Wazen for a really inspiring webinar today. And thank you all for joining us for NCWIT's Conversation for Change, Elevating Modern Figures in Computing. We would really appreciate your input and feedback on this session, and you can do, do so by responding to NCWIT's survey. Um, there's several ways you can do this. There's a QR code you can scan on your screen now. Um, we will put a link in the chat, and you'll also be emailed an invitation by our ev evaluation team um, after the conclusion of this event. And finally, uh, we invite you to join us for our next Conversation for Change webinar. It'll take place on March 2nd. It's entitled The State of Tech Diversity with Dr. Ivory Toldston and Dr. Allison Scott. Uh, we've pasted the registration link in the chat, and you can also find out more by visiting the Conversation for Change webpage um, on NCWIT's website. Thank you again for joining us for today's presentation and see what's conversation for change, elevating modern figures and computing. Have a great rest of your day and goodbye. <laughs>